Good morning and welcome to this Euroactive online event, which is kindly supported by Eberdroller, the Spanish electricity company. My name is Frédéric Simon, I'm the energy and environment editor of Euroactive, and I will be your host for today's event, which is titled COP26, Can Renewed Political Will Result in Concrete Action? Now, today's event comes just weeks before the opening of the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, which takes place in November. A conference that was branded as a make or break, a break event in the fight against climate change, where world nations are expected to make uh, new commitments to reduce emissions. So, what is the state of play now, just a few weeks before Glasgow? Are we on track with, with the objectives of the Paris Agreement? To discuss this today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Michael Bloss, a Green member of the European Parliament coming from Germany, Jitte Gutland, a Swedish member of the European Parliament for the Socialists and Democrats, Maria Mendy Luce, CEO of the We Mean Business Coalition, Simone Taglia Pietra, Senior Fellow at Bruegel, the economic think tank based in Brussels and Gonzalo Sainz de Miera, Director in Charge of Climate Change and Alliances at Iberdrola. Welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. We'll start this virtual conference with a series of opening statements from the speakers and then we'll move on to a Q&A session moderated by me that will also include uh, questions from the audience. If you put your questions uh, to the panelists, just use the chat function on Vimeo and I will take uh, a few of those questions towards the end. Um, I think that's all for me, so without further ado, let me turn to Michael Bloss from the European Parliament's Greens. Michael, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Frederick, um, and I'm really looking forward to this panel. As you said, um, the COP was said to be a make it or break it moment. Um, why is that? Um, this is the COP where the Paris Agreement really comes uh, uh, into existence because the idea of the Paris Agreement is that until this COP, normally it should be five years after Paris, um, all of the different member states have uh, committed their national targets and all of these targets adding up to staying well below two degrees, actually 1.5 degrees. And then in the following up of, uh, of the uh, idea of the Paris Agreement, there should be um, uh, checks uh, um, whether, this, uh, whether countries actually keep track. Now we are in a situation where all of the uh, commitments from member states do not add up to uh, staying within the Paris Agreement temperature goals but they're actually much higher, 2.7 degrees or even more. And that is really risky. That brings us in um, uh, close to the global tipping points uh, where we cannot stop uh, a dynamic that would lead uh, the, for, the, for the planet to get into a temperature uh, a range around four degrees. And this is really deadly. So um, we are really discussing very important things, but we are not there yet. We um, are not uh, yet in the. Uh, we we are not yet keeping the Paris Agreement, and also the European Union is not keeping the Paris Agreement. There has been a latest assessment by uh, researchers from um, the Climate Action Tracker. They still uh, see the European um, um, commitment, the 55% uh, as insufficient for actually being able to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. So this is a problem because if Europe uh, stays insufficient, why or how can we expect other countries that are maybe not that well off to actually be sufficient and in line with the Paris Agreement? So we have to be better in that um, as uh, the European Union in order to really show global leadership and to commit also others to stay within uh, the Paris um, Agreement and the temperature goals and the 1.5 degree temperature goal. Now, secondly, uh, there is the whole question about global um, um, CO2 markets in Article 6. And also here, um, this is there is a huge risk because, for instance, countries like Brazil, they want to 
um, sell all of the reductions they do in Brazil on the global market as emission certificates. But if we are entering in this direction, um, this will be a market with double counting and um, we will not be able to keep the CO2 budget that the IPCC just published in um, in, in this summer um, of now around um, 400 gigatons. So um, we really have to take care that this global CO2 market is not completely destroying um, all of the climate uh, um, efforts that are that we actually see um, currently happening in uh, Europe, uh, in the US, in China and other places. And there's another huge opportunity which we really um, have to um, have to use, which is a, a global coal moratorium where the UK is trying to push for. We have already heard the announcements of China not to finance um, coal power plants outside of China anymore. That's a good step in the right direction. Of course, uh, um, most of the coal power plants that are, are actually inside China. So also there should be no new coal power plants inside China and also in the rest of the world. If we are getting to a global coal moratorium, that would be a huge step towards um, uh, the 1.5 degree temperature goals and towards yeah preserving our planet for the future generations because that's what it's all about. So it's a really important um, uh, COP. Uh, we do not have time. Uh, our CO2 budgets are shrinking and we need the European Union to be a real leader, um, but we also need to seize the opportunities. Thank you, Michael. Let me turn now to Jitter Goodland. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, thank you so much for uh, letting me participate in this timely and important discussion in front of COP. Um, I would like to start on a more general term and uh, um, say a bit about how I feel in the moment we live in, uh, because I think now we have a golden opportunity to do a lot more for climate and we see that the world is gathering and climate is in every conversation in every uh, from from the NGO to the uh, political decisions uh, in um, among governments and also in um, in the uh, companies I would say climate is the big discussion right now and for me, who was also in the European Parliament last legislature, it is a completely different situation than back then. Uh, now everyone seems to be aware and it is much more present. And it, it's always difficult to try to kind of give an um, image or um, say something that, that make all of us see the same thing. But for me, sometimes I feel, I mean, the boat has been uh, this image that many... Um, have when they speak about climate, but for me, I see it a bit like if we are on the beach and we know we are we need to go to an, uh, to another place and we need to cross the sea together. And at this moment, uh, it is we have a choice: either we go now together in a bigger boat uh, where we need to work together. This is a boat that needs uh, the cooperation of all of us, but it will be a calm. Uh, trip to that other place over there where we have a better future together and the other way is that some don't join and uh, it, there will be a later opportunity to take smaller boats but that will be very troublesome during the sea <laughs> it will be definitely shaky uh, and at this moment Finally, it seems like people are on the beach and they are at least saying they are ready to take the big boat together and make the trip less troublesome. And uh, this is where I think we are now politically in front of COP. We have countries there who were not there before on that beach. Uh, we have the US who actually turned completely from where they were a year ago and uh, who is vocal on uh, the message that they would like to take the leadership together with us. Uh, and they also proved a couple of times during this year that they are ready to do so. Um, and then uh, we also have ourselves uh, who have had the most intense climate year um, in history, concluding the climate law 
and the Commission launching the climate package, uh, ready to uh, do much more on the sectorial legislation and also preparing for COP in Glasgow to be a success, hopefully. So that is my image. But I'm also, like Michael, very worried about um, where we are, if you look at the, the facts and uh, how um, the latest IPCC report described it. I must say it was horror reading that report. Um, this is this is not for uh, this is not Sunday reading. It's really scary. It's about um, how we will not uh, deliver on the Paris Agreement if we continue like this. That we have eighty developed countries that not even started the work that we have a situation where the extreme weather will um, take place almost every year, that, that we experienced once, a year, once every 100 years before is now regular, and people die from it. And this is also something that um, uh, the, the World Health Organization is pointing out, that uh, 250,000 people uh, are in risk of dying if uh, if the situation continues like this. Uh, and it is at 2030, that number that they uh, are uh, launching, and it's awful. And this is something we need to avoid. So this is my other image in front of uh, the COP26, that we have an extremely difficult situation going on and that the global heating is now here and it's already people suffering from it, already people dying, and we are in risk of having a very, very um, hard life for humanity if we don't start to take the boat. And then I would like to conclude, I have many hopes for um, COP this year, uh, of course, with that background. Um, I hope that we will have uh, in front of COP uh, promises from all the countries to deliver on the MDCs and that uh, the, the EU leadership will uh, push others to do the same to 2030. I hope that we will have on climate financing um, promise not only uh, for uh, 2030, but also for, uh, no, for 2025, but also this year that we will deliver and um, not um, uh, miss uh, the target uh, for 2020, uh, but to, to actually repair it this year uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the climate financing. And I think Biden's promise to doubling uh, their part should also inspire the EU Commission to do the same. And my final point here, but I have many, but I will <laughs> conclude by, I also hope that this uh, COP will uh, also mean that we have a serious discussion on how we can have better connection between sectorial legislation as a start. And I think the ETS is a, a good method that could be copied and we could have um, that as a best example from the European Union and hopefully help others to do similar things or have cooperation on how we can develop together. Thank you. Thank you, Jitte. Uh, let me turn now to Maria mendy -Luce. Well, thank you. Um, I think uh, both Michael and Jitte have, uh, have presented most of the facts. Uh, and so I don't want to add, I think I can be quite brief because they have covered uh, the main points uh, and the challenge that we have after the IPCC report. And so the co-presidency wants to keep 1.5 uh, alive. And um, and the private sector as well. In the next 50 days are going to be fundamental, I think, for humanity, I would say, and I, I don't want to, these are big words, but we have the COP uh, meeting, but also we have G20 meeting, uh, G20, which covers most of the emissions. And so the G20 countries need to get their act together and be much more ambitious on their climate actions and show the way to the rest of the world, given that they are the leaders of the world. And of course, the NDCs need to be updated. And, um, and, and as you know, the, the, cli the climate law is very, very simple. We need to reduce emissions by half every decade. 
which means that in the next uh, decade, from now until 2030, we need to have emissions. That's it's the biggest uh, reduction uh, that is required in the next eight years. And that's why the Women Business Coalition, together with partners, we launched this campaign all in for 2030. We need to have emissions by 2030 and we need to accelerate action. The private sector is, 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 is scaling up uh, their ambition and actions. Right now, we have uh, close to 2,000 big companies committing to science-based targets uh, to be aligned with the Paris Agreement. 800 of them have also aligned their targets with 1.5. We have more than 2,000 SMEs that have also committed through the SME Climate Hub to uh, be net zero by 2050 or earlier. And in fact, when we ask them, most of them are 2030, 2040. So the voluntary action is there. In today, the Women Business Coalition has launched a letter, which you can read in the press, in which we have gathered more than 600 uh, signatories from big companies, including uh, Ida Perla, that is today on the panel, where, where we are asking very concrete tasks. And I will be uh, explaining those throughout the conversation. But what it is clear is that business are watching uh, governments and they are telling them, the, Governments, you need to be much more serious, get your act together, because our future, our business uh, depends on, on your decisiveness in this fundamental decade. And, and the best thing to do, of course, is to update, update the NDCs to collaboratively work with business in the deployment of the policies that are needed, to be much more flexible, less rigid on the policies, because as we are transforming our systems, we're going to discover issues, like I'm sure Gonzalo is going to talk about it. And, and so, yeah, regulation needs to be flexible and adaptive to the new challenges that we will face. But in any case, uh, with a very clear um, progress towards uh, having emissions by 2030 and being net zero as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Let me turn now to Simone Tagliapietra from Bruegel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. A lot of things have uh, been said already, but uh, let me try to provide uh, uh, with three factors uh, uh, that in my view are going to be fundamentals over the next uh, uh, weeks uh, for the success of uh, the COP26. Well, the first uh, element of the success here is really climate finance. I think uh, uh, it has become clear that this is the make or break uh, element of the negotiations uh, climate finance is the tangible action that provides substance to the principle of the paris agreement of common but differentiated responsibilities uh, the developed nations have not met uh, we know that very well the pledge to devote 100 billion uh, dollars per year to this purpose according to the new oecd data we still have a, a gap of uh, 20 billion per year. And uh, I would also say that uh, uh, this 100 billion figure should really not be seen as a, as a sailing, but really as a floor, because uh, <laughs> of course the needs, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation investments in developing countries are really vast. Therefore here there is a case to really even go beyond this, uh, this figure. I think uh, the recent uh, uh, developments uh, from President uh, uh, Biden are certainly uh, important, uh, even if uh, the uh, EU, uh, sorry, the US can certainly do much more on that front. Uh, I think Europe needs to also uh, scale up uh, its, uh, its commitment. But uh, in general, I think uh, this is really one of the fundamental uh, elements of the discussion as we, we move forward. The second element is, uh, is China. I think it's uh, crystal clear that uh, China plays a fundamental role here. We currently have the new NDCs uh, by, uh, of course, the EU, the US, but the third large emitter, so uh, one of the top three uh, club, let's say, is missing. And uh, while the, the world and the, all of us, I think, uh, welcome the vision of uh, President Xi for uh, carbon neutrality by 2060 and uh, the reach of uh, emissions peak as soon as 2030, I think uh, we still don't have a clear view on how the country 
will really implement these targets. I think the 14th uh, five-year plan was not really encouraging from that standpoint. And I think we uh, should really now uh, look with great uh, attention at the new one plus N so-called uh, policy framework that uh, the government will soon release to understand uh, what the country really intends to do to get there. I think the announcement uh, uh, of uh, the uh, termination of overseas coal funding is certainly a good step in the right direction, as it was said before, but uh, we should also consider the order of magnitude. Uh, China, uh, over the last years, has uh, financed between 20, 40 gigawatt of uh, coal fired power plants overseas, while last year only domestically the country put into operation 38 uh, gigawatt of coal-fired power plants. So uh, the uh, domestic uh, uh, size of the problem is way bigger than the overseas one. Uh, in 2020, by the way, China did not sign any new project already overseas as far as coal is concerned. So there is uh, uh, already a sharp decrease in this activity overseas, which is also driven by the fact that the recipient countries know that renewables are now way more competitive, uh, that uh, the climate-related financial risks are very high for coal projects. So I think the real game changer here will be the domestic dimension of coal in China. Finally, uh, I think uh, uh, we cannot uh, detach this conversation for what is happening on the energy markets these days, and notably, as we sit in Europe, what is happening in the European energy uh, market and the European energy prices. And here, I think uh, the key challenge and the very important point for all of us is to keep explaining that uh, this situation is not a side effect of the energy transition. It is actually a situation that calls for further accelerate the energy transition as a long-term solution to this kind of situation. Uh, this is something that, uh, as we will discuss probably later on, finds its roots in the natural gas markets dynamics globally. And uh, uh, the solution to this cannot be to uh, slow down the energy transition, but to really accelerate it, accelerating the deployment of renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions. And I think having uh, this conversation is very important to make sure that our societies are there backing stronger climate action. And uh, it's very important at this point in time to uh, avoid confusions about, uh, uh, of course, also the, the, the drivers of this situation and avoiding that people can think that this is a side effect of the energy transition, which is certainly not. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. And uh, now to conclude, Gonzalo Sainz de Miera. Okay, thank you very much, Frederica, and good morning to everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this interesting conversation. Um, this morning, I would like to share with you three, three messages mm, from an energy company uh, focused on renewables. The first is that the COP26 is a key milestone in the global agenda, in a political agenda, since it will set the ground for political and policy, this is very important, policy enabling environments to accelerate the much needed green, green investments in to meet the Paris Agreement. So the second point is that a successful energy transition towards a decarbonized economy is crucial to successful tackle this challenge. And there are very positive trends that I would like to, to mention. First is we are experiencing an unprecedented technological revolution of clean energies. Wind and solar for to produce electricity, batteries for vehicles, green hydrogen, etc. So the energy sector, thanks to this clean energy revolution, can be the backbone of this process, providing cheap and clean energy that will help to decarbonize other final energy uses, such as transport, in a competitive way with a, a much better energy efficiency. And as has been said before, some announcements, some important announcements have taken place to accelerate the coal abatement. And I would like 
to mention two things, the UN General Assembly, in the UN General Assembly, China, as one mentioned by, by Michael, announced that it will stop financing coal power abroad following the announcements of Japan and South Korea. And a new coalition was launched, no new coal po power plants by a group of governments, UK, uh, Germany, France, and Chile. And of course, new pledge on climate finance has been made by President Biden and President uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And the third point I would like to share with you is that from a, from a EU perspective, it is very, very important to highlight that the EU27 leadership in the global climate agenda. So the EU NDC, 55 emission reduction target by 2030 compared with 1990, is, I would say, the most ambitious commitment at a global level aligned with a net zero emission scenario by 2050. And the so-called Fit for 55 package and the EU climate law are unprecedented at the global level. It's the most ambitious regulatory package on energy action and, and energy transition. And in this context, I think that despite the positive perspective for the energy transition at the EU, level soaring energy prices could jeopardize EU climate actions and the debate for 55 climate legislation proposals. And in my opinion, as was mentioned by Simone, this situation should strengthen the case for a rapid shift to clean energy sources. But some measures less uh, recently passed by some EU member states, for instance, Spain, could be a step back, but maybe we can talk later about this issue of energy prices and how to tackle them in order to, to, to avoid a confusion. Thank you. Thanks, Gonzalo. Uh, so we can turn to uh, the Q&A part uh, now. And so uh, let me start first with a, uh, a stock take around the NDCs. Uh, and maybe I'll ask you, Simone Tagliapietra, to give um, a, a few thoughts on this. So uh, you mentioned China um, being one, being the largest emitter uh, currently, um, not doing enough to reduce its uh, emissions. So clearly, you see a big gap there. Where are a, the remaining gaps uh, that you see uh, apart from China? Well. Of course, uh, uh, we still have to see the NDC of China. We still have to see also the, the NDC of India and the other developing countries that didn't uh, meet the July uh, deadline of the United Nations to submit the, the plans. So we are waiting for these plans to come. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, that the really uh, important element here is China, unavoidably. And uh, I think it's of paramount importance to move from uh, targets to pathways at this point of the energy of the of the climate crisis. As uh, was said before, also by Gonzalo, it is uh, very important uh, to, to have uh, uh, clear implementation plans. And here I completely agree that the, the, the Fit for 55 represents globally the most advanced policy framework to deliver on an ambitious uh, emissions reduction target by 2030. We still don't see that in the US, by the way. So we also need to understand how the US will actually deliver on the new target presented by President Biden. We understand that the, the policy tool, toolkit can be very different, so not really probably carbon pricing, but then more environmental standards and investments. But uh, again, it is of paramount importance to give clarity to uh, how countries will get there. I think this should be a, a key element in the conversation at the COP, also because this is what, at the end of the day, will allow private investments to really scale, be scaled up in the green transition. I mean, we cannot expect the investment we need to happen if we don't provide policy clarity on this and clear sense of direction. And let me recall one number here. The International Energy Agency 
as recently estimated the energy investments in the world today to be at a level of 2.5% of global GDP, by 2030, in order to get to our climate targets, these will have to go up to 4.5% percent of global GDP. So over the next 10 years, we really need to massively increase investments and only clear policy pathways can drive this green investment wave we need. Thank you. Uh, let me turn uh, to Maria Mendeluce uh, for uh, your assessment of uh, the, the remaining gaps when it comes to the NDCs. Obviously, uh, biggest emitter, China, is still uh, missing others like India, uh, Simone uh, mentioned. Um, in your view, wh what are the biggest remaining uh, gaps? Um, uh, Simone spoke uh, about the, uh, the, the roadmaps as well, which are missing in key countries like the US. Do you share this assessment? Yes. So I think the, the data that Simone has presented is, 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 is right and the assessment correct. I think one of the things that, that we are seeing from the business community, and I see from the Energy Transition Commission, and we had a, a meeting yesterday discussed about this, is the fact that some of the technologies are experiencing in an, an exponential uh, growth, uh, but they're still, they're, their shares are still small, but they're in an accelerating phase, like in an S curve. And those can have a, a huge impact on the NDCs. So one wonders whether those NDCs are taking into account the latest technology developments. Uh, we at Women Business, we're also part of an initiative is called the Mission Possible uh, Partnership. And they were looking at how to accelerate the decarbonization of the how to abate sector. The same here. We think that with a combination of demand signals, uh, policy signals, investors, and the supply side the technology developments, we, we can accelerate the decarbonization of these sectors. This, of course, is not included in the NDCs. And also the third point is that uh, as many of these experiments are happening in Europe, for example, one example is um, Volvo is buying zero emission steel that is produced with hydrogen, uh, which is a, an incredible development. If hydrogen scale uh, scales, the, if we scale the use of hydrogen in iron and steel production, then emissions of cars, the scope three emissions of cars, can decrease substantially. Which in this will de then have a benefit on the buildings that use steel that can be produced as zero emissions. So, these development technological developments are not included in the NDCs are developed in, developing, in developed countries, but could have a positive impact as developing countries can live from on this. To me, yesterday I spoke to Adita Birla, an incredible big Indian companies, to all their staff, and, um, and, and, and it is clear that this divide between developed and developing countries, from a business perspective, it kind of falls. And we also need the leadership from developing countries in the space, especially because Asia is the, the continent that is going to grow the most. And, and so from, from a business community, we, we keep pushing. We, we want uh, those countries to accelerate action. And I couldn't agree more. And I think we'll talk about coal. Coal has no place in the world. Uh, we need to face out as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. So uh, let me turn now to the, uh, the policymakers and uh, uh, starting with Michael Bloss. So uh, a lot of attention uh, now uh, being placed on China uh, and India ahead of COP26. Uh, so what are your expectations at COP26? Do you expect these countries to make new uh, commitments uh, and NDCs? Uh, and how uh, do you believe the EU can best encourage them to do so? Do you believe, for example, that uh, carbon border adjustments um, are the right way uh, forward to uh, encourage uh, China and India uh, to move there? Yeah, um, um, as I was trying to, to uh, describe before, um, of course, um, the, there is attention to, to China and India, and it's good. And I hope that they will actually come with, um, with new targets um, and they will hopefully you know, announce it um, at the COP. And that brings us a step uh, further to um, the below uh, two degree temperature goal or 1.5. But uh, really, um, <laughs> it was now said that the, the Europe has the most ambitious uh, uh, climate uh, law. That's not the case. There are other countries. They're not uh, 
industrialized countries, but like Costa Rica, they're much uh, more advanced. So I just want to stress again that um, it would be really helping our credibility on the international level if we would have a, a, a climate target that is uh, uh, in line with the uh, uh, with the two degree or the 1.5 degree temperature goal, because otherwise it's really difficult for Europe to tell others um, that they should do more and they should keep the Paris Agreement if uh, if we're doing it ourselves. Um, I uh, I also um, uh, really believe uh, that this idea um, that the like the high energy prices right now. Uh, uh, could stop um, the um, the transition or uh, has a, a negative impact on the implementation of 555. I mean, I really hope we can debunk this myth because the reality is gas prices are not uh, expected to go down uh, immediately, but they will stay um, that way. Um, and that is driving, so fossils are driving um, the, the, um, um, the electricity prices up. And renewables are driving them down so what we have to do is really build renewables 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 um as um as fast as possible and there's a lot of questions about you know permits and different member states which we have to really overcome because that is actually what makes our energy cheap and i hope um, that this is also something that europe is bringing to the table much more on the on the international level also in terms of financing in terms of technology transfer um, now for CBAM, um, I, um, I, I, I mean, it is already working, at least that's what I hear. Even the discussion about CBAM is making um, other countries think about um, their uh, production ways, and that's really positive. Um, but uh, CBAM is not there to threaten others. CBAM is there to actually enable uh, um, industry inside the European Union to transform and to uh, change and to change uh, faster than, than they thought, uh, than, they, than they planned to. And because this is also what we need right now, um, we see that globally, um, and that's also the difference maybe with the US, you know, they might, they might not have this, this ambitious climate laws, but they also work differently. They have huge investments, huge investments into infrastructure, uh, into the decarbonization, into industry. Um, and we also need to see the same happening um, on, uh, on the European uh, level um, to have really the acceleration of the transformation of our industry in order to stay competitive uh, in the future decarbonized world. And this is what uh, CBAM should, uh, should uh, help us to and should support. And um, therefore, um, I, I believe it's good. Um, it's also a, a threat, you know, for maybe some countries that have always been the problem the, uh, is is, uh, is um, a negotiation environment where everyone has to agree, and that means always it is uh, the the lowest uh, de denominator that that we are following. So and there's really uh, no instruments to um, to um, to um, well to push them. So so CBAM climate clubs are something on the international level to um, to um, to accelerate things, but the 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 target is to get our industry up on speed um, for the future international markets. Thanks. Uh, let me turn to Jeter Gutland now for your assessment uh, on this. How do you think um, uh, the EU could best encourage countries like uh, China and India to commit to new higher indices? Is it a combination of carrots and sticks? I mean, we, talk about, we talked about climate finance um, uh, Simone uh, mentioned that this was actually going to be the, uh, the one single thing that's going to make or break the, uh, the, uh, the COP26. So how do you think the EU can best encourage those countries to uh, make new pledges? Thank you and uh, thank you to many uh, interesting and important intervention from the panel and I agree with uh, Michael about uh, uh, the importance of acting uh, in our own region, our own union, uh, that is the biggest leadership and that will encourage others. Uh, but I, I would also like to, uh, before uh, maybe answering your question more clear, say that I, I think Simone had a very important intervention on the importance of the more sectorial legislation. And uh, I think in parallel with the high ambition in front of COP26, uh, 
2026 and also um, all the topics that needs to be discussed there, we should also start a discussion on how we can integrate um, our tools, our important climate tools, the sectorial legislations, to be more integrated um, with other big nations and big polluters uh, so that uh, we work in the same way with our industry, energy sector and transport tools. And of course, CBAM is, uh, is something that will encourage that, uh, that we actually give that strong message globally that uh, we on the big imported emission um, imported goods, uh, we will have a, a price on it and that will actually affect also the other countries around the world. So this is a starting point, but I really think we need to work harder on to how we can export uh, ETS to other countries or similar systems. And of course, it needs to be humble and uh, it needs to be in dialogue with these uh, countries but we know that many already started yesterday i i, I um, had an um, opportunity to talk more about the situation in russia and uh, they started uh, a bit on the ets and uh, this is something that's really important uh, i believe that uh, we get that in place in the big nations around the world um that said sticks and carrots um Yes, it's definitely about that. But I also find when we talk about climate policy, uh, we who work a lot on it uh, like to see so many things. There are so many reforms. It's it's this big transition. It's the big transition around globally. So, of course, it's, it's everything. And therefore, um, <laughs> there is a risk, of course, when it's everything that we becomes like puppies with lots of toys we run around and we talk about everything and nothing becomes the big thing and uh, everything is uh, of course important but on on the same time i think there is a limitation to where the world can join and um, i would have wanted this cop to be about how to have a price on uh, co2 and uh, to make that tax globally that would have helped everything and then we would not chase every toy like that puppy we would uh, have something that would influence everything but since that is not on the agenda we need to find similar ways to change the world and we need to find similar ways to affect uh, nations like China to do the right move and I think uh, one thing is definitely that we are very firm that we don't find ourselves uh, uh, full from what we have done so far that we actually deliver more that we show that for our NDCs we are actually willing to do even more than the climate law is uh, saying and we also uh, work in a very determined way to to uh, show that we mean what we are saying about CBAM we mean that also others need to follow in this we need to also say that we know our history, uh, that we have a responsibility, and therefore we are willing to do more on climate fi financing. And the $100 billion that was missed last year, we want to compensate that and help out and make sure that it's delivered this year. We want the even more ambitious uh, climate financing uh, deal for 20. Five and uh, we are also encouraged by the US there and their promises and we can do more from the European Commission and the member states in that sense I believe uh, I also think we um, we we need to also be very uh, firm and consistent in some of the demands towards uh, uh, countries that uh, we speak about today and on China it has been said before but uh, to say that uh, for us, it's absolutely unacceptable that they keep investing in the coal plants. And we want to have a stop on this now. And we we will not uh, uh, stop our firm demand towards China on that until they have stopped these investments. And they should never blame developing countries that it's their demand. It's actually uh, China who is gaining from it and there it's their economic 
uh, again, that is uh, the purpose why this continues to happen. So uh, there we should we should never let go. They should know that this is not something, this is not uh, the pup, the, the toy for the puppy that we lose interest. Uh, we will never lose interest in this one and we will continue until they stopped these investments. And there, I think we also need a better homework ourselves. We need to stop invest in fossil fuel activities and we need to uh, have a very quick plan on this. Thank you. Thanks, Jitta. Um, let me turn to Gonzalo uh, Sainz de Miera uh, about the issue of, um, uh, of financing. Um, uh, Simone mentioned that climate finance coming from the public side will be the, uh, the, the make or break uh, element of COP26. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? And what are your expectations as well when it comes to um, the issue of private uh, finance? for uh, investments into clean technologies. What are your, expecta uh, your expectations there for COP26? OK, thank you, Frederic. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you good news from the energy sector. Uh, we, if we want to tackle climate change, we need to change the current energy sector based on fossil fuels. And we have to substitute fossil fuels with renewables and with better energy efficiency. So the good news is that we have the technologies to change the energy model in a competitive way. So clean energy today are cheaper. Firms, we are ready to invest. Banks are ready to finance. So there is not a problem of financing, at least in, in, in the most developed countries. What we need is policies. We need policies that are coherent and that move in investment in this direction. So we need fiscal policies based on the polluter based principle. We need energy policies. We need industrial policies to get advantage of the industrial opportunities, for instance, in Europe. We need fair transition policies. And for us today, one of the main issues is energy prices. So in my opinion, this situation should strengthen the case to accelerate the energy transition and to invest more in clean energy sources. So we need more, more and more renewables to avoid the problems caused by the dependence of fossil fuels that we are very volatile and that as it is happening now, they have a very high prices. So regarding the, 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 the way to tackle these high energy prices in Europe, but in the rest of the world. So the current situation has its origins mainly in the price of natural gas in the international markets. So this is affecting Europe, course, but also other gas important countries. And the impact of CO2 prices in Europe is much, much smaller, but not negligible. But the cost, I don't know, that 70% of the increase of the energy prices are caused by natural gas. So our view is that we expect this situation in the gas market to be temporary situation derived from some recent events. And in the future, we think that gas prices are going to be lower because the faster the energy transition, you know, there will be excess of, of supply of capacity. So in this situation, I think that intervening the market, as we are seeing in, the, in Spain now, is not the correct answer. So market design is not the cause of electricity prices going up is gas pricing and market design is not a good solution to the current energy prices so even more intervening the market create regulatory uncertainty and will hamper the development of new renewable capacity in spain so for i mean going back to my previous messages we need uncertain we need certainty we need certainty in, in terms of policy and regulation so i think that 
this temporary problem in Europe should be tackled with some measures protecting most vulnerable consumers. I think this is a, a social problem and a political problem. And I think temporary tax reductions, cost deferrals, further protection, for instance, with lack of, of, of payment, et cetera, are very good solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Gonzalo. And so keeping with the uh, uh, business side, uh, let me turn to Maria uh, Mendeluce. Um, your uh, assessment and perception about the current energy price crunch that we're seeing uh, now uh, occurring globally, are you worried that this could um, uh, sideline uh, the, uh, the, the climate action that is expected to take place uh, at COP26 um, with government measures which are being put in place uh, left and right to, uh, to tame the, uh, the rise in energy prices? Um, are, are you worried that climate action could be sidelined? <coughs> Not at all. I mean, Gonzalo has explained it very clearly. Energy prices are going up because of, of, that, of the gas prices and the cost of, of CO2. And, um, and I think we're going to see this more in the future. I think governments have the responsibility to protect vulnerable uh, uh, communities and so that they are not affected because most of them do not have the means uh, to, to, to shift uh, the, their consumption uh, to other sources. But definitely, I see that this is a golden opportunity to continue to grow on renewables. I do feel that with the market, an electricity market that is going to have 80, 90 percent of renewables, I don't know, in the future, uh, there will be some market design that would be required. Uh, but uh, yeah, because because it, it's a very different market than the one we have today. Um, I think. Uh, coming back to the previous discussion around China and other countries for the tax adjustments, etc., just want to give you an example. I'm lately I'm talking a lot with cement companies, and it is incredible what the carbon price is doing to them in terms of spurring new innovation. That they, you know they have been saying for many years, no, we can't do much, etc. Well, actually now they have stepped up. They they are three of the biggest companies: Cenex, Lafarge, Holcim, and Heidelberg Cement that have committed to 1.5 targets that are committed to reduce their emissions 40% by 2030, which is inimaginable before. And this is thanks to a certain extent of, of, of what is happening in Europe these days and the inclusion of these sectors in the ETS. And I think this is a good lesson from developing countries because actually carbon, carbon markets can spur innovation. And if I was in China, and I know because I'm talking with the world, Cement Association that is mainly Chinese, they're really interested to see what is happening because um, their peers in Europe are advancing much faster, are reducing their cost and improving their PNL, even if they have higher prices, because it's giving the right signal. And carbon pricing, it's definitely the way forward. And I think we just need to showcase a, a few of these examples where carbon pricing is, is clearly having an impact in the deployment of low carbon technologies and improving the bottom line of companies and making them more competitive. Thank you. Maria, let, let me stay with you for a follow-up question about your expectations for COP26 when it comes to promoting a, mo a more positive uh, agenda for uh, trade in clean technologies. Um, as we head into COP26, um, what are your expectations on that front? Well, I think, yeah, trade will not, not be discussed, but it underlines all the discussions at COP. At COP, the, the objective from a negotiation standpoint is Article 6, and uh, as, we, as we have listened, uh, we have doubts that they will achieve it. For me, what is more important is what is going to happen in the G20, and, and a commitment uh, from the G20 to step up uh, their climate action plans, etc. I do think, uh, you know, that there is a competition amongst companies and amongst countries on the race to zero emissions. Uh, some are more public, others are less, um, and, and this is good for, for the world. It's good, it's good that this competition. Um, I think border tax adjustments, as discussed before, are a warning signal of where the world could go, which might probably not go there, but it, it is signaling 
to the rest of the world that they need to get their act together and we need to trade in, in a level playing field. Which I think it's good. And I think it, it's good because it will incentivize those countries to introduce market, ma emission market schemes. Um, let's see how the world, uh, the organization of the trade, world trade organizations will, will follow. Uh, I can anticipate that, yeah, that there's going to be some interesting uh, geopolitical moves in, in the trade, in the clean tech trade, uh, but those will not be discussed at COP26, but here in Geneva where I live. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, let me turn to Simone Tagliapietra uh, about this issue of uh, increasing global competition uh, on clean technologies. What is your perception now of the global investment climate uh, these days when it comes to uh, clean tech? Do you see more cooperation between uh, nations or more rivalry between them? Uh, well, on this, I would have a rather realistic approach in the sense that, uh, um, in theory, uh, technological cooperation on different, uh, in different fields, and particularly in the, in the field of uh, breakthrough innovations, uh, would be uh, the best way to go, would make a lot of sense and uh, facilitate technological development. But in practice, uh, what we are seeing is competition between countries uh, on these technologies. Uh, industrial policy is something that uh, belongs to, to national strategies. Now we are trying to, to develop uh, a green industrial policy at the EU level in order to seize economies of scale within the continent and really try to foster the supply chains of the future in a, in a way that we basically don't miss uh, the green uh, technological train the way we lose the digital technological train in the past. Uh, I think, uh, therefore, that uh, international cooperation on uh, green technologies is going to be difficult. We, I think we are seeing that also with the United States. I mean, it's not easy uh, to launch cooperation on green technologies uh, between Europe and the United States. And I think at the end of the Biden presidency, there were many hopes on that, but... Uh, the situation now turns to be uh, a little bit different. Of course, uh, we now have a US-EU Trade and uh, Technological Council, but let's see what we can get out of that. I mean, it would be great, again, to uh, cooperate on uh, technologies like green hydrogen, for example, that needs to be fostered uh, and others, but uh, again, the national interest of developing uh, you know, its own uh, supply chain might prevail. So on that, I think we need to be very realistic. And in Europe, we need to really develop our own EU industrial policy in this space. Uh, I think uh, the uh, case of the European Battery Alliance is a good example of the great additionality that the EU can bring uh, to, this, uh, to this issue, uh, letting players from both pu public and private sectors cooperate on this and countries supporting these new technologies is really important to create tangible action that can lead to manufacturing at the end of the day, which means economic growth and means jobs, which is exactly a central pillar of the European Green Deal. So I think the EU green industrial policy represents a fundamental part of the uh, our collective uh, climate effort. For that, we need uh, certainly these kind of initiatives, such as the alliances, the European alliances, but we also need more investments into innovation and particularly into breakthrough innovation. So here also policymakers need to take risks and uh, really see industrial policy as a basket of a diversified portfolio in which we are really investing in different uh, technologies. Some will go, some will not go, but at the end of the day, what matters is the overall result to be positive. This is exactly how, for example, in the past, traditionally the US government has fostered a technological development in the digital transition with DARPA and other agencies and that's exactly what we need to do as well in Europe we have the facilities to do that I think at the European Innovation Fund under the ETS or I think at the uh, European Research Council so there are initiatives here that we can really build on 
to have a solid and workable industrial policy in the continent. Thanks, Simone. And let me turn to Michael Bloss now um, with a similar question about uh, clean technologies and how uh, can uh, the European Union, but uh, also uh, more globally at COP26, can leaders promote a more positive uh, trade agenda uh, as well uh, to um, uh, develop and deploy clean technologies on, on, a, on a greater scale? Do you think the EU can be a driving force behind this and how do you think it could help? Yeah, as, I, as it was said, um, the clean technologies, renewable energies, they are competitive. I mean, uh, with the right uh, policy framework in place, already uh, now they, they are competitive. India just abolished lots of coal uh, power plant plants and they are now switching to renewables. Why? because it makes sense, uh, because <clears throat> it is cheaper for them. So what we, of course, need to do from the European side is uh, the financing, the support, uh, um, 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 credits, uh, but also like real transfers. Um, so um, and, uh, and in Europe itself, I think we just also have to uh, um, make a breakthrough in the rollout again, because I mean, I, I can only really speak for Germany, but there are so many bureaucratic hurdles uh, for renewables to, to be rolled out that this is stopping. Um, and if we if we take them away, actually would be much further. Just also on the international trade agenda or the pricing, I just want to warn really against the idea that like a, a global price is solving it. I think it's really politically difficult. Um, we already see it uh, in Europe uh, when it comes to the ETS2 for transport and heating. It just means very different things for someone in Romania or in Sweden. Um, if you have, I don't know, like one euro um, um, higher uh, prices uh, for, your, uh, for your fuel, um, because yeah, households incomes are very different. And on a global level, that's even, even bigger, these differences. So, uh, the idea of having one global CO2 price is nice and it should be 100 euros then. But honestly, that is for many people in the South completely unaffordable. So let's really think in the, in the different directions. A moratorium on uh, coal power plants. We already see that uh, for, for, um, for combustion engine cars, um, many countries said 2030 only electric cars. This direction, I think, is much more easier to go uh, because we have to also think about citizens and people that they actually have to deal with such prices and some of the poorer ones, they will just not be able to afford it. So, um, so like, let's um, not try to go only into the price uh, uh, discussion and this will solve everything. It will not because there are people that it, they actually then have to pay the price and for them it will become really difficult. Thanks, Michael. Um, Jeter Goodland, um, um, maybe you can say a few words about um, your views, how you see COP26 potentially promoting a, a positive agenda for uh, global trade in, in clean technologies. Do you believe the EU can be a, a driving force behind this? Definitely. Uh, I'm I wanted to kind of conclude uh, because I'm also a bit on my way after this. Uh, I, I would like to conclude on a more positive uh, tone and uh, say that I feel something that we have not talked so much about during this conversation is the, the optimistic uh, future uh, that is uh, actually ahead of us if we do the transition well and take the leadership now during COP26 and the ongoing years. Um, there is so much uh, hope in this transition. It will not be a worse society, it will not be less um, fruitful investments. Uh, we will, uh, on the contrary, have more jobs, better opportunities, better health, better society with this transition. The problem is really not that. It will also be beneficial for most industrial companies to go ahead and the energy sector is of course the same but there are investments that will be lost that has been already done and this is the obstacles uh,
for some sense also uh, probably that uh, there are money that will be lost uh, and uh, but the message needs to be very positive here that the new investments in the green technology in the green energy solutions uh, in the green production systems they will be beneficial not only for these companies but for the society as a whole and generate more jobs and uh, for the political level, it is important that we also focus on that, but that we acknowledge that some regions will have a bigger travel to get to these better jobs and more opportunities, and they need help during the way to transist. And many times it will be about education, technology um, investments, uh, but also about maybe some security systems for uh, workers who need to uh, go from one job to a new job but this is nothing that's impossible this is not rocket science it's really uh, ahead of us and very natural for the political level to invest in thank you unfortunately i'm i have another event now and they wait for me so i need to go i'm so sorry for that thank thanks Jitta. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today uh, and have a uh, have a good day. Uh, let me turn to Gonzalo Sainz de Miera for um, a, a quick question on on coal. We heard Michael Bloss uh, speaking about his wish for a global moratorium on on uh, new coal power plants. Um, do you think this is something that could reasonably be expected uh, to come out of the upcoming discussions, whether at the G20 or COP26? Do you think that would be a potential measure of success for COP26? Okay, thank you, Frederic. I think this will be one of the questions. I mean, the positive thing is that renewables are cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So there is a case to go from renewables and not for, for coal. Let me say, let me share with you three ideas. First, I completely agree with you, Jite, that we have a, we have to give a positive message because it's true. I mean, with this energy transition, we will have better and and, and more and better jobs. We will have uh, less uh, climate consequences. We will have a better air quality and health. So we completely agree with that. I I, I think it was a very good point what uh, Simone mentioned about the green industrial policy, EU green investment industrial policy. This is fundamental. I mean, there are huge opportunities out there. However, there is a, glow, a growing global competition to get these opportunities, to take advantage of these opportunities. And Europe, we are well positioned to take advantage of some uh, opportunities, for instance, in, in, in green hydrogen, in batteries, and so, but do, we have to be fast. We need to be fast because of this global competition between countries, between firms, between everyone. And the last message I would like to share with you is, sorry, again, this, this, this question of regulatory certainty. So renewables, I agree with Michael, are, are completely competitive, are fully competitive. However, they are fully competitive if gas prices have their prices and if we have a CO2 price. Uh, however, what is happening now in, for instance, in Spain, uh, the, is that there is a charge of non-emitting plants, for instance, renewables, hydro, to extract the income from high gas prices and from high CO2 prices. And this is a very bad message in Europe. I think it does not comply the European single market. It's very bad for, for, for the ETS because it may break the ETS. If some other countries, populist governments or so, they say, the Spanish users are not paying for CO2, why do I have to pay for it? So this is a very dangerous movement and make investments and is make investments in in clean energies and bankable because now in in spain with such an uncertainty you cannot really be competitive and uh, the, the the investments are going to be reduced in the following months so in this sense this all this movement jeopardized the energy transition and the fit for 55 package and we think we need clear and efficient uh, measures and with that i think renewables uh, answer to your question regarding coal renewables are going to be fully competitive uh, compared with natural gas and of course with with coal thank you 
Thanks, Gonzalo. Uh, let me turn to Simone Tagliapietra for a quick reaction on the, uh, uh, the call uh, moratorium. So Michael Bloss says uh, there should be a, a moratorium as soon as possible. Do you believe this could be one of the outcomes of upcoming negotiations, whether at the G20 or at COP26? Uh, and do you think that could be one of the measures of success for COP26? Or is it too early to talk about a global moratorium on coal? Yeah, uh, well, I completely agree with Michael that this would be the best way forward. I mean, if there is one single individual problem we need to tackle as soon as possible to reduce emissions, it is the utilization of coal. I mean, that's uh, crystal clear. And uh, I mean, this is the single most important uh, uh, problem we have today in the climate uh, uh, action uh, dimension globally. However, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, unfortunately, this is going to happen. This is not going to happen because China uh, keeps investing into domestic uh, coal utilization and production uh, for different reasons, because industrial competitiveness uh, for the country is uh, something that remains the top priority, notably after the, uh, the COVID shock and uh, uh, the uh, production of electricity with coal for the country represents a cornerstone also from a social perspective. There are regions in China that are highly uh, dependent on the coal jobs and the coal mining plays uh, an important role in the political economy of the country and the government uh, doesn't seem to be ready to tackle this problem uh, up front. It will take time and uh, here I think uh, uh, one of the of the actions that will first be needed is really to stop building up new uh, coal-fired power plants. But then if you look into the new policy documents of the countries, like the 14th five years plan, you see the government talking about uh, new investments in what they call clean coal. Therefore, it is crystal clear that China has no intention whatsoever, whatsoever to stop funding coal domestically and uh, enlarging the fleet of coal-fired power plants. This will continue. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this makes uh, such a global action against coal very difficult, at least uh, for, the, for the time being. So there it will have to be a mix of, uh, of course, uh, uh, technological incentives. So the the more China will be able to deploy renewables uh, and uh, alternative sources to, 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 to replace coal in the electricity mix, uh, the more this will become viable. On our side, I think that uh, uh, carbon border adjustment discussions will be very important because at the end of the day, we also need to really make sure you know, of having this level playing field. Uh, it is a good sign that China set up a national level emission trading system. We know that the price remains way too low to drive investment uh, changes. So my hope is that by introducing carbon border adjustment measures, Europe and potentially also the United States could also really incentivize China to make its own ETS work in order not to be subjected to the measure and to keep the revenues domestically to further invest in the green transition. Right, thanks, uh, Simone. Um, I think we're getting close to uh, the end of this uh, online event. Uh, but before we close, I would uh, ask each, each one of you to maybe summarize in a couple of sentences um, what you think should be the main takeaway message for um, our, our viewers, uh, our audience today. And so maybe we can uh, stay with you, Simone Taglia Pietra, um, to, uh, to start the round. If you had to summarize, uh, today's discussion and your main message uh, to our audience, what would it be? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, we agreed on the fact that China is, is important for the success of COP26 and that climate finance is important for the success of COP26. Uh, we as European should uh, play our part. So it is very important to do whatever we can on the climate finance side, but it is of particular importance to deliver on our own homework. So we need to, for example, implement, uh, approve and implement the 5455 package uh, as promptly as possible to show to the world 
that uh, a deep decarbonization pathway with a concrete policy framework to get there over the next 10 years is viable. If we give this message to the world, others might uh, follow suit. And this is therefore what we should be focusing on, delivering on our own pathway to decarbonization and become basically a global laboratory for uh, net zero. Thanks, Simone. Let me turn to Maria Mendeluce, your main message and, uh, and takeaway from today's discussion. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. I think the first message is we need to have emissions by 2030. Uh, this is the only way to keep 1.5 alive. So NDC should be strengthened. Uh, political pressure should be given to those that are not yet have not yet presented their NDCs. The second uh, thing is that um, any NDCs coal has no place on it. It's um, ridiculously uh, expensive for society to continue to burn coal in terms of the emissions and the impacts it has on health. And um, countries, uh, you know, companies, more than 600 companies are very clear about it. We need to stop producing electricity with coal by 2030 in developed countries and in, by 2040 in developing countries and immediately stop financial coal internationally. We also need to reduce fossil fuel subsidies and accelerate the deployment of renewable electrification of transport. Carbon pricing is fundamental, TCFD is closer as well. And finally, uh, developed countries should, should honor their 100 billion commitment because developing countries uh, are expecting it and it's been a while that this commitment has not been delivered. So we must go all in uh, for 2030. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, turning to Michael Bloss now for your main message for, for today. Yeah, I, I really liked uh, what, what I hear just now. I mean, um, it's clear renewable energies are not only the solution for climate, but they're also just the cheaper and um, the more competitive uh, solution. So we should really focus on this. And I think we were all clear on this. I, I mean, I also like that we are in agreement that coal is the biggest problem globally um, for, uh, for the climate and stopping um, energy production from coal is really a priority. And in Europe, it should be stopped by 2030 already. We can achieve that with, for instance, an very ambitious ETS. Um, and I think this is something that we as Europeans have to do also in order to be credible to the rest of the world, because then we can be real climate leaders. If we are credible, if we, for instance, stop uh, um, coal power plants 2030, if we have uh, climate targets that are um, um, according to the Paris Agreement temperature goals. And, um, and what I take away from today is it is possible Everything is there. Business communities wants it. What we need to see is a political will. Um, and we need to now create this political will in order to really go to 1.5 degree. Thanks, Michael. Gonzalo Sainz de Miera, you have the privilege of uh, uh, closing uh, this event with uh, your few uh, thoughts um, and words of wisdom. OK, thank you very much, Frederica, and thank you to all of, of the rest of the speakers. I think it was extremely uh, interesting conversation. My, my, our message from Iberdrola is that we have the technology. Uh, we are ready to invest. We are investing uh, what we need our policies. So the Europe, Europe has put the, the most ambitious regulatory policy package to, for the energy transition. That is the 50 or 55. So um, the situation now is I mean, the, the main challenge for, for us is the, the, the question of how to face this energy, energy, high energy prices. So it makes, for us, it makes more urgent to invest and to accelerate the energy transition and to reduce the dependency on, on, on fossil fuels. I mean, increasing renewables, uh, uh, investing in renewables. And I think uh, intervening in the market uh, is, um, is not the correct way. It may jeopardize these renewable investment. And I think it's very important that the Euro Commission defines uh, uh, this uh, uh, toolbox to, to face the, this, this uh, soaring energy prices in an orthodox way and to protect vulnerable consumers. That I think is, is an important question and is key for, uh, 
for a just and efficient and effective energy transition. Thank you. Thanks, Gonzalo. Um, I think this wraps up uh, today's event. A big thanks to Iberdrola for supporting uh, this event. Thank you as well to all of our panelists uh, for attending as well as to our viewers for following us. If you missed the beginning of uh, this program, well, you can watch it again on YouTube and other social media platforms. And if you would like to know more about upcoming events on your active, you can check our website, events.youractive.com for more. I hope to see you again soon. And in the meantime, take care, stay safe, and bye-bye.